So, you might know the situation. Someday you're in some meeting and somebody goes like, oh, this thing is too slow. And they're like, what do we do about it? You're there, you're taking your meeting notes, you're on battery power. So you go on and then somebody says like that thing where we repeat that thing 100 times, that's way too slow. And you go like, ah, I know just what I need to do. So then you wipe out, ooh, wipe out uh, your, your shell. Whoop, your sh okay, maybe here, better. Um, you wipe out your shell and then you say like, okay, got this. I'm gonna see if we can make the things faster or okay <laughs> this is very weird right now um, and so you type a module that you say like okay let's see if we oh, okay keep this up okay can I okay well okay now I'm bound to my desk but uh, we'll manage um, okay so, uh, we write a module that you can see here that says like, okay, I want to repeat a function as a recursive implementation. And that's uh, what we currently use in production, let's say. And we say like, that's, that's what we have to do. So, now we find the timer function in Erlang and we measure it. And it takes 210 uh, microseconds. Like, okay, but what about if I just do a plain old enum each on uh, some list? And then I go like, oh, 165 microseconds. Oh, that's faster, great. And then, well, People always say that tail recursion and recursion is so fast on the Erlang VM, so I'll try it a couple more times, and it's still faster. So that's it, success. We know definitely that all those functional people with the recursion were wrong all the time. Clearly, my enum each is much, much faster, and we can all just go home because clearly this was to talk about benchmarking and everything is fine. Um, <laughs> It is not, because this is clearly an instance of I have no idea what the hell I'm doing here. So uh, there's so many problems with what I've just showed you that I don't know where to even begin. Like you did it on your development machine while you were taking notes, probably Slack was running, uh, you were in battery power, then it was in the shell, it was not like an actual compiled program, it was no production-like environment, and then also is repeating of something, is that really your bottleneck? Have you measured that? Do you know that that's a bottleneck? No, you don't. You just wiped it out and you also took an arbitrary number of 100 things. So it's, it's quite bad because like, whatever you repeat that many times, I guarantee you that the function that you have in between that you call that many times, that's more likely to be the bottleneck than whatever you repeat there. But there's much and more stuff that we'll get into during the presentation. But even if we assume that repeating something is the bottleneck, this was a very, very bad um, benchmark for us because it was no benchmark. I just had one invocation and during that one invocation something else might have spiked up uh, and eaten all your CPU. Garbage collection might have kicked in and that's why that one run was botched. So here's a proper benchmark um, where we define like okay we want to have 10,000 elements because 100 is also a little bit uh, small as we had before and then we define one for enum each. We have also one for list comprehensions and one for recursions and now this benchmark will be run for five seconds over and over and we will aggregate all the results. And now let's have a look at the results. And there we see it. Actually, recursion is much faster than the enum each approach and also faster than the list comprehension. And even by a quite a large factor, like over two times faster than list comprehension and still a lot faster than uh, the enum each. What do we learn from that? We can just take random measurements um, at some point and see like, okay, this is my benchmark now. I've observed this one time, it was faster. That's not how these things work. So we need statistics uh, as well to prove what's faster. And here, as we can see, uh, recursion was faster. So that's my talk, stop guessing and start measuring benchmark practice. Uh, as it was introduced, I'm Toby. You can find me on the interwebs at, as at Prectop. Uh, we also have a look at the library that I uh, authored and maintain, which is called Benchy. And I'm from Leafery, where we run two Alexia applications in productions and otherwise uh, Ruby and where I also use uh, my benchmarking knowledge to make, try to make Ruby and Rails faster and make uh, Alexia even faster. Menu, wem er, wem her er svensk? Or, uh, pardon, woo, wa bra. So, um, you are into svensk, you come from Tyskland, you come from Berlin, man, uh, you are studied at Blekinge Tekniske Höskolan, I uh, Katskona for a month ago, that was Erasmus, and that is in Wackerstadt, that finds a great bra glass. So, when you are uh, in Katskona, you can also go to Glacieren. I was in Europe concerten, so you know where Europe is. 
Men mig, jag lyssnar på Refused, inte på Europe. Men nu är jag på Stockholm och det är min uh, första konferens i uh, Sverige. Så uh, jag tror att jag vill prata lite svenska därför att jag gillar att prata svenska. Så uh, tack ska ni ha. <laughs> Oh, the video. Um, so actually, I wanted to show you a video of my rabbits, but for some reason it's running very, very slow right now. Um, <laughs> um, as a as a little. Um, oh yeah, no, now it works. Um, as a little excuse for talking to Swedish to all the non-Swedish speakers um, for so long. And why do we get back on topic with this video? Because um, you can think of benchmarking a little bit as of these rabbits that eat their food. You put some input to a function, and the, f the faster they chew through that, that's what you want to measure in a benchmark. So you basically have a race of three rabbits eating something very, very fast, and you want to see which rabbit is faster. And sometimes you also just want to observe if one of the rabbits is uh, slower or misbehaving. So if they, because if they eat too slow, for instance, the teeth might be bad. So I hope that reconciles you a bit for uh, hammering some broken Swedish at you. So, ah, this doesn't ah, this doesn't work. No, ah, okay. Oh, thanks. So, in talks, often we have either talks about a concept where we hear about like all how a concept works, and then but then we sort of miss the practical application of how we can apply that contact uh, that uh, concept into our daily lives. And on the other hand, we often have talks that just show how one tool works. And it's like, oh, this is this tool, but then that's fine. You know how to use it for programming language X, but you can't transfer the knowledge to something else. So what I try to do in this talk is I try to marry both of them together. So I'll tell you about the higher level concepts, and then I show you how they materialize in uh, Benchy and in uh, Alex here, so you can r uh, use it right away. By the way, who here would consider themselves like primarily Erlang uh, developers? <laughs> Most. Okay, primarily Elixir? Phew, okay, cool. But so uh, it's good that I put in the work. Um, so the last Benchy release, which is 0 0.9.0, has uh, some nice things to make it run easily if you want to call it from Erlang. So like all the functions are now defined on an atom. Like in a proper Erlang, you can also use atoms uh, as keys and everything. So it is usable from Erlang. But the bridge is still not too easy because I thought that because like Erlang packages are now also like the Reba free packages are on HexPM and we all run on the same VM, that it would be very, very easy to call Elixir call code from Erlang. It's not. And it's like, I don't know, from, from the JVM world on the other side, they always say like, if you release a library, release a jar so that everyone can use it, that you'll be a good JVM citizen. And I don't think we have that in uh, the Beam VM community or Elixir quite yet. And so I was very sad because it was very hard for me to set up. I also don't know that much Erlang. But there is a Reba free plugin, which is Reba free Elixir compile, which is actually from BarrelDB. Someone from BarrelDB also gave a talk yesterday, but I think he's not here. Um, it sort of works, but I have my problems with it. So there's a list of issues. If you know Reba free and any of that stuff, if you want to help me off of that, that's cool. But you can call it uh, from Erlang. So this is also uh, usable for you, um, the library. And I hope uh, I'll show you and convince you to maybe use it or set up an Elixir project that then has your Erlang as a dependency and use it from there. So before we get into the meat of um, actual uh, benchmarks, we have to talk a bit about theory first. Because like, so what's the difference between profiling and benchmarking? We also had talks about uh, profiling here. And what profiling does is profiling uh, gives you these nice graphs, like a flame graph, a, cost, a flame graph or cost stack trace that goes like this particular bit of that took that and that much long and or that longer than the other thing. But um, profiling adds a lot of overhead because it has to add lots and lots of instrumentation everywhere. So the overall execution gets slower usually. I think in the Beam VM it's not as hard, but if you do it in Ruby, it takes forever. And so this. Profiling is very nice to see like what part of your function, if you're not sure, takes uh, takes up all the time. Whereas in benchmarking, we don't add the overhead; and we just see like how fast is something, and it's better for really comparing implementations and everything. When we do benchmarking, something that we have to ask ourselves like, what do we want to benchmark? Like, what's the value that we want to optimize for? And we have a couple of options. We have runtime, which is the most popular, but we could also optimize for memory usage because maybe. Uh, my memory usage is blowing up, and that's why I have to scale up my servers. You can also um, benchmark for throughput or some custom benchmarks. And 
Honestly, my favorite custom benchmark is the uh, Phoenix Road to 2 million WebSockets uh, benchmark. So what the benchmark there for is like how many WebSocket connections can we make to one single machine running uh, the Phoenix, the web framework um, for Elixir that is very good uh, with WebSockets. And it started out at about 100,000. And within the course of, I think, a couple of days, they made it to 2 million by doing some performance improvements. And even when they had 1 million, no, 2 million, sorry, 2 million clients connected, um, Jose, little troll that he sometimes is, posted, I think, a whole Wikipedia article in there. And it's still uh, delivered to all the clients within, I think, one or two seconds. So that was quite amazing. And so that's a custom benchmark. That's not just runtime or memory, but, a, but something different. And it ran on a very huge machine, but it's not even maxed out yet. So it would it stopped at 2 million because they set the file limit handle for 2 million because they thought it would never get that high. It's one of my favorite benchmarks of all time, personally. Um, so what are we going to talk about here? We're going to talk about runtime because runtime is what people mostly talk about and uh, Benchy doesn't yet support measuring memory consumption. We're working on that, so there's like a pull request where we try to get that feature in so we can also see, because sometimes it's a trade-off. Sometimes you make something faster, but therefore you consume more memory. For instance, if you introduce some caching or memorization. So that's also important information for you to know when you optimize your functions. Another thing we just always don't want to know, like what's fastest, but sometimes we also want to know how long will this thing take that I just did. And so for me, for Benchy, I wanted to know how fast enum sort is in Elixir, because to compute some of these statistics, I need to sort all the runtimes that I have. And if I run a micro benchmark, it's very easy to, in five seconds, gather millions of inputs. Uh, well, maybe not millions, but one of thousands, but I could have millions of inputs that I need to sort. And that's why I also see like, what's the maximum value that showed up in my sample set. And so you can see for a list, of 5 million elements, oh, maybe you don't see it that well, I should maybe still stand here, um, it took uh, a little bit more than two seconds, which is still doable. When you run a benchmark, you can run, you can wait the extra two seconds in the end, I would say, but I was ju just want to see if it's feasible or if, or if I have to implement some fancy algorithm that does it in linear time, which I had no intention of doing and so still don't have. So the other questions, of course, are, did we make it faster and what's fastest? And here I have a little quiz for you. What's the fastest way to sort a list of numbers largest to smallest? We see uh, the benchmark here. So we have a list of 10,000 elements. Uh, we shuffle it. And then we have three candidates. First can oh no, wait a second. First, let's go through the candidates. First candidate just sorts it and uses the custom sort function so that we say that the first uh, thing is bigger than the second. So that ends up in a reversed list. Then we have. OK, we just sort the list, and then we reverse this. And then we have a clever trick, because we know we have only numbers. We say sort by minus that value, which will also end up in the reverse list. So now the task is for you. Which one of those do you think is the fastest of these options? So who thinks that the first one, the custom sort function, is the fastest? One person, OK, oh, three, OK. Uh, we get uh, slightly different results each time. Who thinks that sorting and then reversing is the fastest? Um, that's about, like, say, 20 people. And who thinks that uh, sort by is the fastest? Um, a bit more than before. And so what's actually fastest is the good old just sort and reverse. And it's actually over four times faster than sort by minus value. And that, to me, was a bit mind-boggling when I first encountered it uh, back in Ruby, because I thought, like, what? But like, I really tell it what to do, and otherwise I just sort of stupidly reverse the list. Like, what's, what's the point? Um, but when you think about it a bit more, uh, reverse in Erlang is probably implemented in C. So it's a very, very fast operation because we need to use reverse lots of times when we do a, a tail recursive function and then we need to reverse this in the list, uh, in the end, sorry. Um, so reverse is highly optimized and maybe sort is also more optimized than passing a custom function. And that's w just one of the cases where your intuitive guess oftentimes fails. I mean, I would say about one third of the room got it right, but the other people uh, got it wrong. So that's why we need benchmarks where we can't just trust our instincts. But at this point, you might also ask, like, isn't that the root of all evil? Because you've heard that somewhere, right? Like somebody said, uh, pre-measured performance optimization is the root of all evil. You've all heard that, I guess. Um, for me, it's more like not reading the sources is the root of all evil, because people just quote papers, but they don't ever read the papers. Or like, people read the papers, but too many people don't read the papers. So if we look at the paper, 
then it says we should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. So it's there. Clearly, you're right. You don't need to benchmark. We don't need performance optimization. Everything is great. Donald Knut, one of the fathers of modern programming, said so in 74. The very next sentence in that paper, if you just read on, says, yeah, we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. A good programmer will be wise to look carefully at the critical code, but only after that code has been identified. That goes into profiling and general application performance monitoring. You should know what is slow and what actually matters so that I can improve it. He also goes on to say that he thinks that a 12% uh, improvement in performance is really significant. So everything that at least gives you 12% performance improvement is very, very good. And everything that I show you here is at least 50% and not, uh, if not twice as uh, much uh, performance or twice as fast, sorry. He also goes on to say what I just hinted at. Uh, oftentimes, the first judgment that you make, your intuition, is very, very wrong about what's fastest and what's slowest. So you always need to measure. So. Once we have covered this base, uh, I have to cover another base, because when we just say benchmarks, wh what even is a benchmark? What does a benchmark cover? And there's many, many different types of benchmarks. And I personally like to liken it to the testing pyramid. Um, I don't know how familiar uh, people in the learning space are with that, but um, it's very common in Ruby that you have like first unit tests that just test a single unit, like one single function. Then you have integration tests, a couple of parts play together. And then you have feature or acceptance tests. We mostly do web applications, so it's mostly some clickety thing that goes through the whole browser and tests everything uh, on a user level. And I like to uh, put benchmarks on the same uh, scale. So what I would test with a unit test, it's micro benchmarks. I just test one small little function. Micro benchmarks do a bit more together, and the application level goes through the whole stack. That's a bit hard to imagine, I think, at least for the application benchmark. So what's an application level benchmark? You might have seen this. This is the I forgot its name right now, I'm sorry, the, the something shooter where they uh, compare um, web frameworks, like how fast can they handle HTTP requests and update something in the database and that sort of thing. And that is lots of different languages. Application level benchmarks can even be independent of the programming language because you just use a tool like WRK2 that just fires HTTP requests at the server, measures how long they get back, and then get like the mean time, the throughput, and everything else. That's an application level benchmark. So what are the properties of these different benchmarks? First, the components involved go up as the farther we go to the right, because micro-level benchmarks are just what I showed you before. We saw the list, very little components, and then it gets more and more. At the same time, the setup complexity gets higher. So if you run an application or even a micro-level benchmark on, let's say, a web application, and you don't have any data in your uh, database, what's the point? You don't have anything to benchmark against. Um, also, the execution time goes up. I can get good results with micro-benchmarks very fast, but the bigger what I do is, the longer it takes. But at the same time, on a positive note, the confidence of a real impact goes up, because when we do uh, these micro-benchmarks, like I showed you before, the one with repeating something, if I make that even 200 times faster, there's no real guarantee that it would make my application 200 times faster. In fact, like, it won't. Um, so especially in the Ruby community, there was lots of hype that now regexes are faster in Ruby. Like, yay, but that will make my application maybe 0.5% faster. I mean, it's cool that we do that, but it doesn't help my application as much as many people will make you think it does. But at the same time, also the chance of interference gets bigger. So if you do actual HTTP requests to some server somewhere, you might have a network split or whatever, like something might break, so you might get actual wrong results. Also, with all the setup complexity, I showed you these application-level benchmarks there. We found out that some of these benchmarks, like they run on like an 80-core server or whatever, but some of these language implementations just spawned eight threads, so they are not using all the cores, so the, uh, the comparison is basically irrelevant, I would say. Most of the time when someone shows you a shot like this, uh, they will tell you that this is the gold middle, this is what you should aim for, and it's a very good spot to be in. So in web development, I usually just take the code that one control action, like that one HTTP request triggers, and I benchmark that code. That's fairly easy for myself to set up, and I'm still very, very confident that it will have a real impact of what I do. And at the same time, we'll just talk about micro and macro benchmarks here, because as I said, application-level benchmarks are often language independent, so we'll focus on that. So let's get to good benchmarking. First and foremost, when you want to do good benchmarking, you got to ask yourself, what am I benchmarking for? What am I trying to improve? Am I trying to improve the user experience? Am I trying to improve the server scalability? Um, does this endpoint really matter? Like, If it's a very slow endpoint, but it codes once a week, 
honestly, who cares? Because like maybe if that user is my CEO, maybe I care. But otherwise, I don't. But if it's a even slightly slow endpoint that gets called 2,000 times per minute, then I really care about it. And so that's what you got to be um, conscious of. Secondly, tell people what you run your benchmarks on. First, it should be very close to your production system, or as close as you can possibly get. Um, and otherwise, results might differ for different Elixir versions, different Erlang versions, or just with a different operating system, or whatever is underneath, or a different version of the database. So tell them uh, what you do. Which is why uh, Benchy, when you start it for the first, when you start a benchmark, it will print out already a summary. That's a new feature in 0.9 um, of like what's the the process you have, how many, how much RAM do you have, how many uh, CPUs do you have. So the goal of that is whenever somebody just copy and paste a uh, benchmark done with Benchy, I want to have all the information that I need um, to, from that benchmark to see what I can do, and I want to help the people to write good benchmarks and provide the information to everyone. Um, yeah. Um, also, please create an interference-free environment. I sort of blamed Slack before, and I'll do it again. Sometimes Slack just hogs, I don't know, 50% of my total CPU time. And then when I run a benchmark, it's twice as uh, slow as it would normally be. So really, close Spotify, close Slack, close all of that. And uh, be sure that really your program has the time to run, because it has on the server. And you don't want your local machine interfering with any of that. And also, one of my favorite mistakes for benchmarks when people post on the Phoenix mail list, oh, Phoenix is so slow, I thought it was fast, is that they're still running in development mode with like everything logging turned on to the fullest. And that takes most of the time of the actual benchmark. So try to get out of that. Also, something that I realized is might be slightly more con uh, controversial here is garbage collection. Um, we can't turn off, to the best of my knowledge, please correct me if I'm wrong, we can't turn off garbage collection in the Erlang VM. But why would I want to do that? Especially for micro benchmarks. If within one of those micro benchmark runs, garbage collection triggers and hits you, you get a spike. And that's, you probably can't see it quite well, maybe it's better on the monitors. This is a graph that also Benchy generates for the Benchy HTML plugin that shows you a uh, chronologic list of all the runtimes. And you can see that there's a very blue base level, like almost all the measured times are within here. But then sometimes spikes go up. And I'm, I can prove it to you right now. It could be something triggering on my uh, laptop, but it could also be, or I'm pretty sure at least some of the times it's garbage collection triggering, like, okay, I need to collect some garbage now. And for micro trends, uh, for micro benchmarks, that really ruins your results because it sort of gets the average way up where it shouldn't be. Um, but of course, for application level benchmarks and macro benchmarks, please don't turn off garbage collection because garbage collection is a real thing that your uh, program does. Gets me to another point. You need to have a really correct and meaningful setup. Um, that especially also the, uh, um, applies to what I said before, like the Phoenix development, like your environment should be the production environment. It should have all the caching and everything that you have in production and not just your development environment because usually with debug information, it's way, way slower. If you do compiled languages, it should be compiled with minus minus optimized, minus minus optimized free. That's lots of the uh, faults that I see uh, with benchmarks in the wild. And also, um, not completely related uh, to Erlang, because Erlang doesn't have a JIT yet, and I would really, really love for Erlang to have a JIT. So if someone here is in the OTP team, please make the JIT happen. I mean, we saw it's, it's in the works, but I would love it. Um, especially JITed languages, like the JVM as a big one. And oftentimes I see people make a benchmark of the JVM, and they just make one call, or just make calls for the first second, and they're like, oh, these results are so bad. Clearly, the JVM sucks. It's like, no. The JVM, especially with big applications, you got to give it sometimes five minutes of warm-up time. Like for smaller benchmarks, maybe a couple of seconds. But just execute the functions, don't get the measurements, and then after it's warmed up, after it has done all the jitting, because during jitting, it's also slower, then can you get the actual measurements out there. Something else that's very important to me is that Inputs really, really matter when you do benchmarking. I see so many benchmarks where people just take some arbitrary input and don't benchmark against multiple different inputs. And inputs are like the skyline. They're very, very different in size and shape and everything. And sometimes really weird uh, inputs can be your worst case of performance. So I believe the worst case performance of quicksort is an already sorted list or a reverse sorted list. That's the worst case. And maybe you want a benchmark for that, for the worst case performance. And otherwise, you also need to have different input size to see how behavior changes. And now it's time for a little story 
that I have for you. So I said, like, I work at Leafery. We're a same-day delivery company. And so we have an application that is called the Courier Tracker. And one time, our back snack lit up. It was boom. I was like, well, boom, boom, OK, boom. Um, <laughs> Um, I hate that. Um, so the boom, and I was like, what, what, what's happening? And it goes Alexia DB connection error. I was like, what, what's happening? Like Alexia is super fast, like and like super reliable and everything. Like why would that happen? I look in the logs and it's like, okay, DB timeout, uh, 15 seconds. I was like, what did we do an SQL query that took longer than 15 seconds? That can't be. And so, like, what the courier tracker is, does is like we have couriers that have our Android application and they. Um, push the location updates via a socket uh, to our career tracking application, which then goes to our admin backend so we can see where the couriers are. And a very common thing that we do is we want to get the latest, career, um, the latest location of a career. And OK, this goes bad again. Um, so this is what we do. And I saw that the fold was in that code. So I was like, OK, I know this. I know benchmarking. I'm going to benchmark this. So this is the benchmark. Um, it's, it's a real case, as I just told you. And I'm going to go through the different implementations very quickly. Um, this one up here is a database view, which is what we used until up that point, which is a database view that just has like really all the latest locations of all the couriers um, as a database view. And then we just get the one with that courier ID, and then we just get that one uh, location. And the ones down here are mostly the same. So we just say, like, OK, we want to get uh, from the courier locations, we want to get the one with our courier ID, we want to order them descending by time, and we just want to get one, and we want to get that one. And the only difference between those two is this one is full custom, uh, it's called, because it does a direct career ID, that thing. And that one uses a uh, something that we've already implemented, a uh, scope, but that uses sort of like an array inclusion thing, so it might be slower. So, And I also saw that for that one career for which that bug was happening, we had 2.3 million locations in the application, because there was a bug where it resubmitted locations all the time, and um, we didn't reject them, which we fixed in the meantime. So I took, um, I took a database with those 2.3 million locations, and I ran it. I ran a benchmark, and I saw, or you might see that, the with courier IDs and order and the full custom is much, much faster than using the latest courier location thing. Like that one was super, super slow. Now we're super fast. So we're great. Make the fix. Deploy to production. Boom, it goes. And it goes, LCDB connection error. It's like, oh, what? But I fixed that one. I benchmarked it. I know what I'm doing. Another LCDB connection error. And lots of them more. And I go like, what is happening? I don't know. Like, I benchmarked this. I, I know my shit. I fought. Um, oh, well, I still do. So. What happened again, I looked at like which, of course, I rolled back the deploy, and I said, like, OK, what happened? And I looked at it again, and I saw that the courier locations for which it was crashing right now were couriers for which it had no location at all. Like, there was no location. So I wrote another benchmark uh, where I said, like, OK, these are the courier IDs that I have. And by the way, this is my favorite Benchy feature that I don't know of any other benchmarking framework, is I can give a map of inputs um, up here. And then I just say, OK, Benchy, I can pass in some configuration options, like please take those inputs, and then whatever the input is, is passed in as a first parameter into my benchmarking function. So I can run the same functions or the same set of three functions with four different inputs, so it will run 12 uh, benchmarking jobs. So I can have a good overview of which uh, function performs in what way with which input. Um, a feature that actually originated when I was uh, contributing something to Alexia because uh, Jose was like, oh, but how does it behave with other inputs? I was like, good question. Please, let's do that. Um, OK, so I have one that the big one with the 2.3 million locations. I have one with no locations, one with 200,000 locations, and one with 20,000 locations. So now if I run that, and the old means now like what the code was at that time, and we can see that our latest query location, the database view, the old thing that we used, it's the slowest when we use it with the one with the many, many locations, with the 2.3 million. But as soon as it gets less and less location, it becomes the fastest again. It's way, way faster than the others. And yeah, especially for the case with no locations, the other ones are super, super slow, and this one is fast. And this is so counterintuitive, because we always think like, OK, I want to see how fast that function is. Let's just throw like the biggest amount of data that I have at it. And if it can handle the biggest amount of data, surely it will be fine. And that wasn't the case here. So just another time to see it. Here are my more custom versions. They're the fastest when we have many 
uh, locations, but afterwards they're by far the slowest. So what happened? Um, I ran an explain analyze and uh, SQL on it, and I noticed that it didn't use the Korea ID index at all. So at that time we had one index on Korea ID and we had one index on time. It just used the time index uh, to which makes sense because we want to sort time descendingly. So it sorted the times of all um, locations descendingly, and then it just looked through and uh, tried for the first time to find the one with the Korea ID. If we have no Korea ID at all, it goes through all locations. Hence, it takes so long. So of course, what's the solution to that? It's a combined index. We didn't have that uh, before, which is obviously a shame, but it ran fine until the time. So created a combined index on Korea ID and time so that it first looks at Korea ID and then can look at time, which is what we mostly do because we only ever want to have a location for a specific Korea in that application. So and with combined indexes now, we can see that consistently, consistently the full custom implementation is the fastest. Um, and so I was very happy with that, deployed it. But before I did that, I was like, wait a second. Before I mess something else up, I write another benchmark. And I wrote a benchmark for insertion time. Because especially when you start adding indexes um, to your records over and over, your insertion time might go way up. So that's also a very, very important thing for you to measure optimally at all times that you see like, OK, if I add this index, it's a trade-off, my insertion time goes up. But since we read that data way more than we insert it and we never update a location, actually, um, it's fine. And that's just something like if you take nothing else other than you should do more benchmark from it, please benchmark with multiple inputs. It's also very interesting. I, I have the example later on as bonus slides, but um, when, you d when we do telco optimization, it can be that, no, telco optimization, if we do recursive functions, uh, the performance characteristics of body recursive functions and uh, tail recursive functions can be different by the number of inputs. So for smaller inputs, body recursive functions can actually be faster than tail recursive functions. And then, but for bigger inputs like 5 million, tail recursive functions become faster again. So uh, thanks uh, for sticking with me for so long. So I waited the excursion to statistics until the end to tell you all the funny numbers that you actually see there and uh, not scare people away with that in the beginning. And to talk about these statistics, uh, I figure like I take the most commonly spoken language between all of us, which is as a common denominator, Elixir. So the average, you know, it's pretty easy. We take the total time and we divide it by the number of iterations. It's sort of the standard measure that you see. Uh, I'll get into why it's not the best measure uh, in a moment. So then we have standard deviation, which was also brought up in the keynote uh, this morning, uh, which is uh, basically uh, we always deduct whatever sample we have uh, right now from the average, and we square that, and we add that all up, and then we divide it by the number of samples. And the standard deviation is a measure of the uh, spread of values that we have. And of course, in the end, we also take the square root again. So why, why do we do that um, again? Because uh, we want to have a measure of like how spiky our distribution is, like how many outliers are there. And this uh, is, again, the raw runtimes that go by time that uh, Benchy generates that show you, like, here's some spikes, but that might just be in the beginning or something. You want to see how spiky um, it is. And this is another graph that Benchy generates. It's a histogram. And it basically takes runtimes and puts them into buckets. So you can see that here in this runtime buckets, there's quite a lot of them. And there will get fewer there. So you see, like, this bucket is the one you hit most commonly uh, with your runtimes. But you can also see, like, why does this graph go all the way to the right? Because there's little, little bars there that you don't even see because some runtimes were in there. And those we call outliers because they're not typical for the distribution, so they're too far away. And that's the one thing that you want to see, like, how many are there and that you might also want to get rid of. And by the way, this is a distribution that has a very low standard deviation. I think it was even below 10%, so it's a very good standard deviation. If we had a distribution with like 50% standard deviation, this would look way different. And also, in the uh, graphs before, you might not have seen it in the normal bar graphs. You see here um, this little black thing that goes up and down. That's a measure of the standard deviation. So there you can already see like how big is the standard deviation, how how, does these, how do these results vary? And you can see if they sort of close together and the standard deviation bars overlap, then you can be like, OK, uh, maybe uh, it's just randomness that caused this result. So something that I'm a big fan of is the median. Um, and here we go into why I benchmarked the sorting time. Uh, because the median is basically you sort all run times that you have, and then you just pick the one in the middle, and you say, like, OK, this is my median. It's so the middle value in there. And why is the median so cool? 
um, it's not affected as much by outliers as a little example. So this is a distribution where we have about, I think it was 15% standard deviation. Um, the average is here. And I don't think that the average here gives me a good indication of what the actual performance of the system is because I know 90% of all my runtimes are actually faster than the average. So it's a very bad value because it doesn't give me a good, um, a good knowledge about what's a typical value or what's a value that I'm that are most encountering, and also does give me a good measurement of like what's a bad value that I'll encounter lots of times. But the median is up here, and uh, that's a very, very, let's say, typical value, or I think it's a better representation of the benchmarking results as a whole than the average here. Also, box plots, uh, Benchy also generates. That's one of my favorite things. So who here has seen a box plot before? Who here knows what they actually do and like what all the lines mean? Oh, OK, still a couple of people. So for the others, um, I'll say, so the one in the middle is the median. We just talked about that. And then from the median, so the median is, I have to be careful with this. Uh, so the median is sort of in the middle. And once you have that middle, you take the other two halves and you also cut them into halves. So you go here and here, so the upper and the lower half. Um, this is where this line comes in and that line comes in. That's the, the quantile, so you sort of chop it up into four regions, and the two regions in the middle are the quantiles that you look at, and this is quantile two and quantile three. And this one minus this one is the interquantile range. So and now, if you go up from the upper one by one and a half interquantile ranges, uh, you see this one here. So this says like, okay, shows you, gives you a measurement, okay, results of the runtimes go all the way up here, and if something is even outside of that interquantile range, you draw a dot, uh, which means um, this is an actual outlier. It's ooh, okay down here again um, because it's so far off. Interquantile inter range. Um, so that's that's a box plot. It's very handy for see how are the values actually distributed. Oh, so okay. Um, so a little bit more about Benchy at this point. Um, I think about Benchy. Um, I've written a small benchmark library already in Ruby, but what I really, really liked about functional programming and immutable data is that it led me to this design of Benchy, which I personally think is very, very nice. We have one, um, if you don't know what the pipe does in Elixir, it basically takes uh, this argument, puts it in as the first argument there, and then whatever is returned from here is put in as the first argument into the next function, and so on and so forth. Um, which is uh, beautiful uh, to my eyes. And so what I do is, at first we get a configuration, Benchy is initialized with the configuration, then Benchy uh, gets system data, and all of that, during the whole process, we have a big, I call it suite, is a big data structure, and all of that data that we gather through these separate steps is uh, added, as added to the suite. So for instance, here we add a benchmarking job, then uh, we call measure, which actually runs the benchmarking job and produces raw runtimes. Then we generate the statistics, and then we have different formatters that, based on all the data that I've gathered so far, can uh, give me console output, CSV, JSON, and HTML output with fancy graphs that you've seen so far. And this is also an official interface to Benchy. Like right now, we already use the more uh, convenient Benchy run interface, but this is basically what it does underneath, and this is also an officially supported interface. So if at any of the stages you want to go in there, grab the results, do something yourself with it, you're welcome to it. That's what it does. And that's how the data structure does, uh, what, the data stru what, the data what the data structure looks like. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, there is a key for each of those uh, major steps that said, like there's one that has a config, the other one for system, jobs, runtimes, and so on and so forth. So that's very easy to work with in the end as well. So there's a couple of uh, plugins uh, that I mentioned. A little bit ooh, loud. <laughs> this is me. Um, OK. Um, I'm going to. Uh, Maybe if I hold this close to my chest, it seems to work. He's coming. Can you do? OK. Good. Uh, let's try it again. So um, one of my personal favorite benchmarks is the flat map versus uh, map.flatten uh, benchmark. You can see here again with multiple inputs and so on. And we have 
two versions, flat map and map.flatten. And when we run that benchmark, Okay. When okay, so yeah, really close. Sorry. So when we run that benchmark, uh, what do we see back in Elixir 1.8 um, is something that I wouldn't have expected because uh, flat map is far more specific than uh, map dot flatten, but map dot flatten uh, outperforms uh, flat map by quite a huge amount, and it's like, what? Why is that happening? That's not my expectation at all. Uh, coming from Ruby or Scala or wherever. And, but, you know, it's fixed in Elixir 1.4. So here you can see, I mean, the graphs sort of look the same, but if you see flat map is now up and uh, map dot flatten is 1.5 times slower than flat map. So how did that happen? Well, it was actually the first benchmark I ever wrote with the first version of Benchian. It was always weird for me that it was slow because it should be faster. Flat map is specific. So I wanted to fix it at some point, but I looked at the flat map code and was like, oh, well, fold L maybe another day, and at some point I opened an issue at Alexia and was like, hey, flat map is slower than map flatten, and Erlang's uh, list flat map is also way, way faster. And that's like, this needs to be faster, I think. And Jose answered within 18 minutes, and within those 18 minutes, he wrote two alternative flat map implementations that are both faster than what we had at this point. I was like, what? So I benchmarked them, and both of them are faster. And I still don't know how he did that in 18 minutes. I think I always think I'm a pretty good programmer, but that's something that will always boggle my mind and um, admire Jose. So in the end, uh, Jose said, thank you for benchmarking. And that's also what I want to give you. Like, do these benchmarks. If you find something that's also slow in the, li in the library, people usually appreciate it when you give them the benchmark. Be like, here, that's all. So I'm also uh, part of the Wallaby team right now, and we know we're a bit slow and also slower than Hound, but we're we're trying to get uh, faster, but we at least have the benchmarks to have a baseline to see, do we get faster? Does the performance optimization that we do actually matter? And so as uh, Jose thanked me for benchmarking, I want to thank you as well. Enjoy benchmarking and tuck. So any questions? Otherwise, feel free to come up to me. I'm always happy to talk to people. As he said, I'm very sociable. <laughs> no questions. Uh, I'll post the slides online. There's also some bonus slides in the end uh, with Merge 2 and Merge 3 and stuff. But yeah, thank you a lot. <laughs>